Want to do a deep dive into Reactor 4 in Chernobyl? <laughs> of course you don't. That'd be radiation and instant death. But a look at the meltdown of science and politics with Adam Higginbotham and his fabulous new book, Midnight in Chernobyl, is up next on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovetz. Adam Higginbotham's new book, Midnight in Chernobyl, is a shortlist finalist for the Carnegie Medal, and for good reason. Early chapters offer an understanding of the science of nuclear physics and the politics of the Soviet Union, making the reader an insider to both these complicated worlds. So when we read that a young man sunbathing on a residential roof on the morning after the Chernobyl nuclear accident is impressed by how quickly his skin tans, we feel the deep horror and loss in just a few sentences. That suntan was killing that man, and yet he went out and got more. Do we as a culture have a, a difficulty understanding the relationship between cause and effect if there's any distance between cause and effect? I think definitely. I think that's one of the things that makes kind of radiation and radioactivity and nuclear power as a whole you know, so frightening to people um, is because, you know, the, eff the effects of radiation seem almost supernatural because you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, it's invisible. Right. Um, and then furthermore, as, as you point out, you know, the effects that it has on you can also be divorced by time. Right. So you can realize that you're exposed to radiation and then you go away not having felt anything right. and then you can worry for months or possibly years afterwards about what the effect is going to be and has been on your body and, and on your health over the long term. In your book you really get us into the rooms where it's happening in the Soviet Union in 1986. How did you get into the room where it happened? Well sometimes I literally went into the rooms where it happened. Um, but. Um, but a lot of the time I did it by, by talking to people who were there at the time and interviewing them wherever possible. So, you know, I, I interviewed one guy who was at the control panel in the control room of reactor number four at the point when it exploded. I interviewed an, another guy, Sasha Yevchenko, who was in the building at the moment of the explosion. You know, I also interviewed people who served on the government commission who were in the those rooms where people were debating what the immediate response should be in offices in Pripyat on the night of the 27th of April, um, you know, and, and people who were on the special operations group that ran the overall Soviet level response to the accident from Moscow after that. Um, but also those, you know, I had access to, to the transcripts of the trial that took place in 1987, which went into a lot of detail about decision making and behavior and who was where when in the control room and in the plant on the night of the accident. Um, but also a lot of transcripts of Politburo meetings which revealed who was saying what to whom and who was trying to cover things up and who wasn't um, in Moscow in the months after the accident. So there's a, there's a lot of material that I was able to synthesize together to, to really take you as close as possible to being in the room as it happened. Were they eager to talk to you? Um, some people were, were grateful that they were getting to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. Some people um, who'd been, you know, I found one or two people who'd been interviewed by journalists before on many occasions, and it was clear that uh, they regarded the whole process with suspicion because what had happened is these journalists would come in and they would ask them about you know, the most terrible thing that had ever happened to them in their lives. And they would want to know the most gruesome details uh, about this thing that had, that had often ruined their lives or killed their friends um, or made them sick or all three. And then as soon as they got the most gruesome parts of the information of the story, mm. they would just leave and they'd never hear from them again. So they, I think they, you know, some people felt sort of rightly felt exploited by this process. And so part of my job in approaching those individuals was to explain to them that, that what I wanted to do was something different, which was to tell the whole story of what happened, um, the whole story of their lives, so that, that the readers of the book would hopefully be able to understand, you know, not only what actually happened on the night of the accident, mm. 
but but what life had been like in in Pripyat in the city that all the operators of the plant the plant lived in what that was like before the accident and so what they'd really lost what their lives had been like how they'd been changed by the accident uh, yes most definitely because I think it's very important how we tell the stories and when the story was told to us and I was alive in this when this happened in real time but Pripyat was always sort of a dead city to those of us getting the story afterwards. And your book brought out that it was actually a great loss, that there was something right. unique and remarkable about this city at this time. The, I mean, that was one of the things that I was really determined to do when I began uh, researching the book, was to, was to try and reconstruct life in Pripyat in, in as much detail as possible. Because, you know, I was guilty of, of, the, the, of a similar, um, I was guilty of, a, of a, a similar set of convictions because I was 17 when the accident happened. And I realized as I began meeting people that lived in Pripyat that I had been just as much a victim of Western propaganda as they might have been of, of Soviet propaganda in their view of the West. So even when I started meeting people who lived in Pripyat, you know, I was surprised to discover that they weren't all sort of gray victims of the socialist experiment who lived miserable lives and expected to die, you know, under the iron heel of Stalinism. Um, and, and instead that they were people who at the time of the accident weren't much older than me and they had hopes and expectations of, of living in what at the time was this fantastic city that was extremely well resourced. It was surrounded by sylvan countryside, by white sand beaches. You know, they took boat trips up the river. They had children in kindergarten and, yeah. and you know, dozen, a dozen schools, um, that it was a great place to live. And so I, I, when you realize that, the story becomes uh, even more terrible, really, because if you, if you rest on the assumptions that everybody that lives in the Soviet Union has a grim existence, then the Chernobyl accident doesn't really seem so bad or so unpredictable. But when you realize that they were living these kind of what they regarded as these blessed lives, relatively speaking, in the Soviet Union, then the accident becomes even more terrible and its impact much worse. Yeah. Most of us are aware, because it's on T-shirts now, that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Understanding that there's a boatload of energy trapped in matter gave birth to nuclear physics and eventually nuclear reactors. But Einstein's equation does not tell us about the extra bits that pop out in nuclear fission. So what are the byproducts of the destruction of an unstable atom? Well, I think what you're talking about is, is radiation itself and radioactivity. In order to attempt to regain equilibrium, uh, atoms throw off parts of themselves. And um, the parts that we're concerned about form ionizing radiation that takes the form of, of uh, both particles and waves. And the principal ones, the principal kinds of radiation that we're concerned about in the Chernobyl disaster, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, so alpha particles, for example, are relatively speaking like cannonballs. They're very large and slow moving, and their path can be blocked by something very insubstantial, like a piece of paper or your skin. So although they're very dangerous if ingested, if you keep your mouth shut and you don't breathe them in, they don't go in through your eyes or your airways, then you can be protected against them. But once inside your body, alpha particles are extremely toxic. So uh, polonium-210, which killed Alexander Litvinenko, the FSB agent who died in London, was poisoned with, with polonium-210, which is an alpha emitter, which was concealed in a cup of tea that he was given. Um, beta particles are uh, uh, more penetrating and can therefore pass through your skin. And those are the things that, in the case of the Chernobyl disaster, caused people terrible burns uh, on their skin, some of which were, were substantial enough to end up contributing to people's deaths. Um, but by far the most penetrating are, are, are gamma rays, which are, are, relatively speaking, like a sort of fusillade of microscopic machine gun bullets that will pass straight through your body, straight through you know, electronics, disrupting them along the way. The rays can snap particles of DNA, and they can only be blocked by things that are very dense, like sheets of lead or concrete. May I ask, if you don't mind, you're a journalist. What does your high school physics teacher think of, of your, your newfound understanding of these complex things? I have not been able to ask him, but I suspect he would be utterly astonished as physics was far and away my worst subject. And I should point out that, uh, you know, in order to write the parts of the book that you're talking about that explain these concepts, 
and hopefully, hopefully inform to some extent what I just said. You know, I had a lot of help from a lot of extremely patient physicists and nuclear engineers um, who will hopefully not be too disgusted by what I've just said. <laughs> In many ways, Higginbotham's book is the story of two sets of chain reactions, one political and the other scientific. On the scientific side, nuclear power plants are called reactors because while the first atom takes a lot of energy to break, everything else is a chain reaction. And in Midnight in Chernobyl, when we meet the gigantic reactor number four, busy churning out radiation, it practically has a personality, and it's not a very stable one. Were most Soviet RMBK reactors a little recalcitrant even on their best days? The reactor operators that I spoke to, um, you know, described the RBMK as, as being a kind of a capricious beast uh, because it was absolutely gigantic. It was extremely unpredictable. Um, and it was, it was hard to operate even when you knew exactly what you were doing. So, you know, one operator told me that, that essentially you would sweat like a man digging a ditch if you were the man who was, who was running the controls on the control panel for the reactor all night. Um, and some nuclear stations had two operators doing what they called du playing duets, where they would double up on the control panel because it was so physically exhausting. You'd be on your feet for an entire eight hour shift pressing buttons and moving levers around in order to try and maintain the thing in a stable condition. But that can't be good science. Does this all come down to the Soviet's obsession with uh, uh, economies of scale to make something scientifically not the best idea? It was, I mean, a lot of it was to do with economies of scale. A lot of it was to do with the, the nature of the technology that they had to use because they didn't have access to more sophisticated technology. So the RBMK was a lot easier physically to put together and to build um, than the pressurized water reactors of the kind that were being built at the same time in the United States and still being used now. Um, you know, the Soviets could build their version of the, of the PW, PWR reactor, which was called the VVER, uh, but they lacked the sophisticated tooling necessary to churn them out in the numbers that they wanted to make nuclear power stations come online as quickly as they did. So while they could build these things, they took ages to build, extremely complex, the RBMK could be just banged together on site. And when they wanted to make them a bit bigger, they could just kind of add the, add the bits in a modular way. Um, and so, so really the kind of, the problems with them were a result of the, of the elementary and crude nature of the technology, which was sourced from, from directly from military plutonium production reactors that were originally much smaller and operated at lower temperatures and lower pressures. So when they scaled them up, they created a lot of problems. The fatal flaws of the RMBK reactor was revealed at Chernobyl when operators instituted the AZ-5 emergency shutdown protocol and graphite control rods that encouraged additional reactions before reducing them were introduced into the number four reactor. And as HBO showed us in their somewhat fictionalized version of the disaster, that one single element of failure makes for a great scene in a movie. But there are a lot of other problems, like what is a positive void coefficient? Well, the positive void coefficient is actually, as you suggested, it's one of many, many different faults um, or design drawbacks, I guess you could say, uh, that were part of the RBMK design that, you know, any individual one of which would not have been on its own enough to have caused a catastrophe. But what happened on the night of the accident is the positive void coefficient, you know, was combined with four or five or six other problems of both the Soviet workplace and the reactor design and the nature of the experiment that they were conducting, you know, to form this kind of deadly confluence of events that all came together to cause this massive explosion. And the positive void coefficient itself, you know, is... is um, it's a bubble! It is. It's a it's, bubble! It's partly caused by the voids, which are steam bubbles in the water coolant that's circulating through the reactor core. But all nuclear reactors have these bubbles in them to a greater or lesser extent. The problem with the um, RBMK design is that the positive void coefficient can lead to a feedback loop in which as the reactor becomes hotter, it increases the level of reactivity in the core. And that makes it hotter. 
and that makes it increase the level of reactivity in the core, which is the opposite of the way a Western PWR reactor works, where if you lose coolant or too many steam bubbles form or the, the coolant drains away entirely, it acts like a dead man's handle on the reactor and the reactor automatically, effectively shuts itself down. Does that feeling of little hiccups, little bubbles, make you a little crazy? Or well, I, don't, I think that that's, you know, if you look at any technological disaster, that's certainly something that they all have in common from, you know, the Titanic to the 737 MAX accidents. There are all these confluences of all of these tiny things mm -hmm. coming together at once. They're rarely, you know, as simplistic as one person pushing the wrong button at one time. Right. Um, and I mean, that's, that's the nature of, of high technology, I think. And so, so that's, why, that's one of the reasons why when people ask me if, you know, I feel that, that Chernobyl shows us that, that mankind has no business meddling with nuclear energy because it's so dangerous. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that it, it, it should be a warning against the risks of overconfidence in high technology, whether that's, you know, uh, the 737 MAX or, you know, um, AI and Facebook and algorithms. And, you know, all of these things have the same potential to undo us mm. if we're not paying close enough attention. How did they not blow up the whole world? And, and how did the Soviet political structure create a chain reaction that led to Chernobyl? I think that the problems with the Soviet system were, were social and political. So the Soviet workplace was an extremely weird environment in, in which to work, in which everybody really, um, you know, paid lip service to the ideas of Marxism, Leninism, and the realization of true communism, a, a workers' utopia by the year 2000. But everybody knew that nothing worked properly. Everybody knew that they were tangled in these ridiculous thickets of, of rules and regulations and bureaucracy and party red tape. And they knew that in order to get anything done, they would have to ignore a lot of those rules and regulations. And everybody did it. Um, and at the same time, nobody had any sense of individual responsibility because the bureaucracy was so complex. There were so many different layers of, of, of party and government um, hierarchy and bureaucracy that you could easily just, just you know, not take responsibility for anything that you were doing. And deceit was sort of trafficked in, in both directions, up and down the, the chain of management. So these ridiculous overestimated targets would be passed down from on high for what you should be achieving if you were manufacturing platform boots or tanks or electricity in a nuclear power station. And everybody below them recognized that these are unrealistic targets. And yet they would pass up the fact that they had overachieved and they had you know, exceeded the plan or they had uh, over exceeded the quotas that they were supposed to be producing. And, and this led to a, a system where you know, deceit was common currency and nobody knew what was true. So Gosplan, which was the organization in Moscow that was ostensibly in charge of the centralized economy that was sending out these targets out to the provinces and out to, to other republics, had no idea of what was true about what was being produced anywhere at any given time and what could be delivered where within what margin of error to the extent that eventually the KGB had to turn their own spy satellites onto Soviet Uzbekistan in order to get a sensible reading of what the cotton harvest was going to produce that year because they couldn't rely on the information that the managers in the, in the country were passing up to Moscow. Can, okay, well, so can any kleptocratic government with no regard for facts, truth, or personal responsibility do good science, build good things? I'm really just asking for a friend. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very easy to draw parallels between, you know, the Soviet government in 1986 and any Western governments that might be around us at the moment. But I think what that leaves out a quite important element of what was going wrong in Chernobyl in 1986, which was that, that what motivated a lot of the, the problems was simple expediency. So they were trying to cut corners, not because they were ignoring science,
but because they needed to get things done. They needed to shut this reactor down, they needed to produce electricity, they needed to make the reactor work, they needed to build another two reactors that they wanted to finish within the next two years. And so they, you know, the, the people who were operating Chernobyl were not ignorant of what was going on. They weren't denying the science of, of radiation or the science of, of how to build a nuclear reactor. They were just trying to do it in a really reckless way. And, and that really is at the core of what went wrong, is that they had they'd got away with being reckless this way for an extremely long time, both the operators at, at individual reactors and also the heads of the organizations that were responsible for them. So people like Efim Slavsky, who was the head of the Ministry of Media and Machine Building, or Anatoly Alexandrov, who was the head of the Kurchatov Institute, which was the Atomic Energy Institute, you know, both had had personal experience of being exposed to large doses of radioactivity. And they were still alive, and they liked to drink vodka and cognac and reminisce about the old days together. But it engendered this arrogance and this mm. sense of expedience that they could get away with anything. And, it, and it, what, that's one of the major drivers of what went wrong, not the, deni the denial of the science of atomic energy. Well, you, you said expedience and arrogance, and I had assumed incorrectly that you were going to say fear when you said when you paused before you said expedience i was expecting the word fear they were not afraid uh afraid of radiation or afraid of <clears throat> well they obviously were not afraid of radiation for all kinds of reasons but they were were they uh, do you think that they were afraid that failure was punished so egregiously they were definitely i mean it was in the culture of the soviet workplace that that any given individual did not want to be the deliverer of bad news because they would be held personally responsible for it. So there's a culture of managers downplaying or denying or completely covering up things that had gone wrong for fear of losing their jobs or being disciplined. So that, yes, that's absolutely right. Fear played an enormous part in the Soviet workplace. And Viktor Brahanov, who was the director of the Chernobyl station, you know, is, a, is an excellent case in point because he started out as someone who was young and ideal, idealistic and was prepared to say no to his superiors initially to the extent that when he encountered all sorts of bureaucratic and labor roadblocks in the first months of trying to build the station uh, back in the early 70s, he went to tender his resignation to his immediate boss thinking, this is a hopeless job, I can't do it properly, I quit. And they just tore up his resignation letter and told him to go back to work. And at that point he realized that you know, he just had to say yes to whatever the party demanded. In the 1979 film The China Syndrome, Jane Fonda and Michael Douglas play a reporter and cameraman who witness an emergency core shutdown procedure at a nuclear plant. That movie, The China Syndrome, was a fiction, but the theoretical concept at the center of the film took on a terrifying reality as Reactor 4 burned. In real life, what turned the idea of The China Syndrome from a thriller into a horror movie? Well, Reactor Number 4 began to melt down as soon as the explosion took place. And so um, what happened was the, the uranium fuel inside the reactor began to liquefy and it burned its way through the bottom plate of the reactor, which was also displaced. And so it kind of dribbled out of the bottom of the reactor and then began flowing into the rooms below. And it was, by this point, it was in some places more than 5,000 degrees centigrade in temperature. And so this, uh, what became known as corium, the molten fuel, began to burn and absorb parts of the reactor building and the reactor vessel itself. So it took on a kind of life of its own, of subsuming material from around itself and then continuing as it, as it flowed into the rooms down in the level immediately beneath the reactor to then flow into the rooms below that. And ironically, through uh, pipes and tubes that were part of a steam suppression system that was designed to help prevent an accident. It then found its way into the second, third, and then the fourth levels beneath the reactor, threatening to eat its way through the very foundations of the building and find its way towards the water table that was beneath that. So theoretically burning all the way to China. Well, that's the idea. That's, the, that's, that's the why name. it's called the the China syndrome, even though that's like this physically and geologically and right. geographically impossible. Right. But California. more dangerous than theoretically burning all the way through to the other side of the globe is hitting that water table. 
Right. I mean, what happened was the, the Soviet scientists could not get inside uh, the reactor building to find out exactly what was going on. And the readings that they were taking from outside, um, atmospheric readings of the radionuclides that were being liberated by whatever was happening inside the building, um, could not tell them with any degree of accuracy what was happening. So they came up with all sorts of terrifying worst case scenarios of what could happen. Um, and so one of those things was that the steam suppression pools I mentioned contained were sealed tanks, part filled with water. And they feared that what would happen if this superheated corium made contact with this water that was contained inside these sealed tanks, it would effectively produce a sort of a massive steam powered bomb that would then destroy the entire building in a catastrophic explosion that could be even bigger than the first one oh, and liberate all sorts of, of radioactive material into the atmosphere um, and poison an even larger area than the first explosion. So that was one thing they were afraid of. The other thing was that if that didn't happen, then the corium would eat its way through the foundations of the building and then poison the water table of the river Pripyat, which was directly beneath the reactor building. And that led into the water table of the Dnieper River, which fed fresh water to the population of Kiev and a large area beyond. And then beyond that would feed into the Black Sea. So they, would, they feared that they were facing this absolutely catastrophic environmental disaster, worse even than the one that actually happened. But in the end, none of this took place because before it could escape the building, it cooled and solidified and stopped right there on the last level of the, uh, the basement room. <laughs> And we're out of time. I'm so sorry. There's so much more to talk about, but thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.